the beautiful thing is that your brain's plastic. So you're always changing, you're always learning, you're always adapting. So we can just do some behavior change work, have you do some training and actually rehabilitate those areas. And then you can start to regain whatever function it is that you want and actually have the freedom to do what it is you want with your life. Hello, and welcome to the Rise Again podcast. My name is Dr. Peter Reisenden, and I'm your host here at the Rise Again podcast. Now we're on to season two, and the thing about season two that's gonna differentiate it from season one are the things that I've gone through in my life since we were doing season one. We have recently fostered and adopted a newborn. I killed my first bull elk with my bow and arrow last fall, and I've gotten into fly fishing, as well as am now the medical director of a men's health and testosterone replacement business. This has all been majorly life-changing for me, and I'm super excited to share some of the journey with you guys through the Rise Again podcast. So I hope you guys get something out of this. If you guys love it, please rate it and review it. Share it with your friends. Let's get the stuff out there. We're going to share some amazing guests, and I hope you guys really enjoy season two of the Rise Again podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to the Rise Again podcast. I want to introduce a guest to you guys today. His name is Tony Ryan. Tony is the founder and owner of Tony Ryan Neuroathletic Training. He's worked in the training and rehab field since 2010 and has worked with a myriad of different populations. From experience with rehab of PTSD, ADD, autism, chronic pain, and other complex issues to training professional athletes in various sports, Tony has extensive experience in taking people from their worst physical state to their best. Tony has worked alongside various doctors, PTs, chiropractors, and other medical professionals as a primary referral to assist them with their most complex patients. In addition to running Tony Ryan Neuroathletic Training, he's formerly the education advisor for Z Health Education, the leader in neurocentric education for health and fitness professionals. He's a master practitioner candidate with Z Health and has taken over 400 of their hours of coursework for continuing education in the field of applied neurology. You guys are really going to enjoy today's podcast with Tony Ryan. You know, there's a lot of really incredible things that Tony lays out very simply and easy to understand ways for all of us to be able to relate to the issues we have going on in our lives in super simple ways to fix them. Get down in the show notes as well. You're going to be able to find his Instagram on there. I'm going to share some notes for you guys. And I hope you guys have a great time listening to this episode with Mr. Tony Ryan. Oh, man. Yeah, we'll say that quote again. What was that? What was that quote? In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) That's a little bit of a life philosophy. Right. (laughs) Yeah. It is. Because I don't have to know everything. I just know a little bit more. And at the very least, that can benefit people, right? You share that a little bit more. And maybe that helps a lot of people out, you know? Yeah. Instead of being so insecure about it. Right. Well, I mean, in the conversations that we had and the one that we had last time, I mean, I you know a lot, but you know, it's kind of like the, the, the whole Bruce Lee quote of at first a punch is just a punch. The more you get to know the punch is everything. It's the, you know, it's the physics behind it. It's the motion, it's the energy, it's the universe. And then, and then after you understand all that, a punch is just a punch. Like yep. you kind of go back to <laughs> yep. simplicity again, but you got to go in deep to come out Yeah, it's true. You go to that overanalyzation stage, you get all the little details. And then when you think of the punch, you just, you get all of them are just kind of encapsulated in that one thought. Right. It's that one chunk. So yeah, right. I love it, man. So welcome to the podcast, man. Great to have you here. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. When we were out shooting our bows and I found out it was one of your first times being an archer, I was like, I need to get this guy on the podcast because of what you do and uh, the people you help and, you know, just your personality. I think there's a certain type of person that I'm attracted to spending time with and you're just one of those people. Take us back, man. So you grew up, uh, like, where was growing up for you? And Growing up was Tucson, Arizona. Yeah, so northwest of Tucson. Grew up pretty standard middle-class American upbringing, you know? Went to private school, Catholic school, all, like, K through 12. Dad was really blue-collar. So it wasn't, we weren't on the high end of that. He just worked his butt off to send us to good school. 
give us a good foundation, that type of thing. He's he's a farm boy from Pennsylvania. Wow. <laughs> so like, yeah, his dad owned a mechanic shop. His dad was a was a desert rat in World War II. That was a mechanic that worked on trucks over in Africa. And they had a mechanic shop and a farm. So he grew up on the farm and in the mechanic shop, just very, very hardworking, blue collar guy. Went to Penn State, um, did some like, basically did uh, civil engineering. So land surveyor. So I got to grow up with him after having that education. He got a little more just intellectual, I guess, on that side because he went into engineering. And then I grew up on like surveying like construction sites with him. Um, just being able to get outside and work since I was, I think the first job I went on with him was like four or five years old. I remember that as a, as a fun part of my upbringing. That work ethic was just kind of always there. Mom and dad, and then a couple of brothers. Yeah. Two older brothers. And they definitely have to be forced. You're forced to learn in that environment, right? You either keep your mouth shut so you don't get beat up and you don't get pushed around. And when you keep your mouth shut, you actually pay attention. You learn a lot of things. So um, you get to soak up everyone else's mistakes and not make them and then just be ahead of the curve in terms of everyone else. But yeah, all, your, all your peer group, you really just, you get that advantage if you choose to take advantage of it. So it's amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm the oldest of eight. So on the opposite end where I hope that I wasn't a terrorist to my younger siblings. You know what I mean? You know, it's yeah, kind of one yeah. of those things where... I mean, I actually went through, uh, there was a, there was a time in my life where I really had a lot of remorse over things that I did do to my younger siblings, as far as just, just being a brat, right? You're mm-hmm. growing up, you're not thinking about what the long-term impact is. And as I'm going through school and like my counseling programs and stuff like that, I'm like, man, I hope I didn't like scar some of my siblings with some of the ways I was right. Just yeah. name calling and just being a dork. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so anyways, I ended up writing some of my siblings some letters and just saying like, I really, and then calling them and just really saying, hey, like, I just feel really sad about the way I was when I was younger. I'm just thinking about it now. And how did it impact you? You know, and they were, oh, it didn't impact me as as much as you think it would have or whatever else. But yeah, and I, th- I kind of feel that way. I, I, I mean, having worked, you work through it in your late teens, early 20s, and you just kind of go, oh, no, I'm like way better for it because of that. Like it makes you more resilient and actually like that type of social interaction teaches you how to interact with everyone for the rest of time. So you understand people are their own individuals, they make their own choices. And like you get to choose to not be bitter and just take away the, basically take the meat and spit out the bones. You know what I mean? That's kind of how I've always approached it. And like, honestly, it just toughened me up, made me more resilient. Like I have some thick skin because of that. To be fair, like both my brothers, like their heart was always to teach and help me and make me better. Like anything they did for the most part, obviously, was always the occasion of emotional outbursts that everyone has. But for the most part, there was always like the standard was high because that's the family standard. Like we perform at this level because that's that's who we are. And any criticism of any of your actions was because of that, not because they just wanted they were insecure and wanted to beat you up. It was just, you got to perform better. You got to be better. It'll come back to bite you later if you slack off. You've talked very lovingly about your brothers and that's really, really special to have that bond. Who would you say is probably the most influential person in your life growing up? Ooh, probably my dad. That'd probably have to be my dad. And we're still pretty close too. He lives, what, 20 minutes away from me. He's phenomenal. Just real teacher's heart. Really, especially as he's gotten older, a lot more, a lot more patient but just some of the values and the principles and like the integrity aspect of things, especially as you get into a bunch of different areas of the world. And like you see a guy that doesn't compromise on certain values, like work ethic, but also just the way he would treat people, the way he would take care of people. Like I remember I I was uh, growing up playing competitive soccer, right? And I had a goalkeeping coach that was from Mexico. Um, He was a professional player in Mexico, but he he had come on some hard times and he was like living out of his van and he was coaching us. And this is like the premier club in Tucson that we were playing for. And we paid a lot of money to play there. But for some reason, that gentleman just be falling on hard times. And I remember that my dad was just such a good guy. I remember he came to our house one time and my dad spotted him like 200 bucks or something, which... I, I would just think of that now with five kids and they were doing that thing. Like that's, you're going pretty severely out of your way to help somebody there. But just instances of that all throughout his business, the way he ran his business and did everything that he did. The stuff you notice as a kid, you don't think much of it at the time. You're just like, oh, okay, like whatever. And you look back and and you start to see some of the way you operate under pressure and you go, oh shoot, I got that from him. Like I can't even take credit for it. I'm like, right. I got that from him. Powerful learning. Yeah. What do you see in your life? And you're a super humble guy. I don't expect you to like stand on a soapbox and say, I got this from my dad. These are all the positive things. But what are some of the things you feel like you picked up from your dad? I would say, like I said, integrity, like the values in terms of like how you treat people all the time. (laughs) You certainly got that. Particularly like as I've gotten more, like the last six months, I told you, uh, I've been doing a lot of market research, been more on the Instagram to just try to up some awareness of some of the things that I'm speaking about. And as you talk to people, it's funny. I just treat people the way I would treat them in real life on the internet. Not everyone's that way. Clearly, if you've been on uh, any social media platform in any regard, but like just I don't ignore people. I address people respectfully in every regard. And like that 
that's just a habit. Like that's a habit based on my environment and that's not everyone else's habit. So you start to see that stuff come out as petty as the internet might be, as much as that's not a measure of anything legitimate, I, in my opinion, it just, it's one of those things where I'm like, I can't help it. It just, it's just who I am. And in any learning environment, whether it's jujitsu or like even when we're out shooting bows, you, you see some of those eagerness to learn, like all that stuff starts to come out in any environment where you're just, there's no ego. There's no, uh, I, I use the word ego when we've talked about that, but uh, it's more of a martial artist like reference. But there's no insecurity of going into any environment and being willing to fail and capable of learning. Like, yeah, I remember a lot of times when my dad would push me out of my comfort zone and that's the only way you grow. And now that's just such a normal environment where if Adam invites me to go bow shooting and I've I've only shot a bow once and it was eight months before, I'm still like, yeah, man, I'll totally go and we'll figure it out on the fly. Totally. Yeah. That's pretty unique. I think most people are, I would say, if you look at most people, they're not doing too many things that are outside their comfort zone. I don't know. It's kind of interesting how I was talking to someone recently. They're like, you know, we just learn all through school. We're expected to learn, 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 learn. And then we graduate and then people just kind of either go to college or else they, and then after college, they just kind of do their thing and they like don't grow anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, really? Start to think about it a little bit. And I was like, I suppose you could get away with that to a certain degree, but that would be a really like boring way to live life. What I think particularly the way I approach school, because I learned before I went to school, like I had my older brothers. I told you the reason I skipped a grade is because my middle brother would come home from second or third grade or whatever he's in. He would teach me my times tables when I was like three or four. Which is crazy. Which is, which, but I didn't know any different. That was just my frame of reference, right? For me, learning was never associated with school per se. And then when I would get into school and we would do like standardized testing, I would get frustrated with standardized tests because I'm like, there's no context here. Like you want one answer out of these four, but like, what about these four possibilities? And I would start thinking it through and it would just frustrate me and I put an answer down and move on. It was always interesting to me because I, I always felt school was more about like the result of the test taking instead of about learning. And you would get different vibes from different teachers. Like people, there were people that genuinely wanted you to learn and they would teach a certain way. But like that whole process, even in like a higher end private school, it was, it was interesting to me. I always had an interesting view of that, particularly as you get through college and other things as well. So I know some people actually that are very close to me that didn't finish whatever college program they even started. It's just because they couldn't, it didn't interest them. It didn't, it wasn't like, and it almost like didn't meet their requirements for what they expected from education almost to a certain degree, right? I have uh, some people actually were really close to me who were just like, forget this. And they're off doing way more and way cooler things than people who finish, you know, whatever, doctorate, master's degree programs to have a diploma hanging on the wall saying that they can do X, Y, and Z. There's people out there that are doing incredible things. And, you know, so you went to K through 12 Uh in the private school. And then what did you end up doing beyond that? So I went to University of Arizona. I started as pre-med, like physiology major. And as I was getting through that, wanted to be a doctor and just my exposure to that field generally. And, and thankfully, I had some good people around me that kind of like forced me to do like some internships and some rotations and go shadow some mm-hmm. doctors and stuff. And the more I did that in, in two regards, part of the reactive approach, and maybe it was because of one of my um, shadowing experiences within it was in a withdrawal clinic for dealing with a lot of people coming down from a lot of drug usage and things like that. It felt like there wasn't a lot to do to help them. Like we were just kind of hanging out, doing assessments and not really doing anything impactful. And between a couple other shadowing experiences, that was pretty much the case. And then the more I looked at what I wanted out of life, like, uh, so I graduated just when I turned 17. My parents were going through a divorce my whole senior year. Oh, so understanding, that's brutal. Yeah. So understanding that dynamic and knowing like, hey, man, like I really, really don't want that for myself. And then starting to associate some of what I saw with doctors lives literally and going like, Hey, there's a pretty high divorce rate in this community. Huge. Yeah. There's a pretty high sense of dissatisfaction in people's lives in that community. And I go just fortunate enough to have a little bit of a decent head on my shoulders to go like, Hey, like I kind of see the writing on the wall here. Like don't really want to go that route. Um, and then when I started to, to, turn away from that route, I, I kind of knew, I was like, hey, what's the point of going to school? If you're not going to be a doctor, lawyer, or engineer, I was like, I don't really see a whole lot of, I mean, credibility in a degree. It doesn't really do a lot for Especially me. Especially when you got a head on your shoulders. I think in, t- in, in a day and age where in, in, you can learn what you want to learn. So you can apply yourself and just pick up whatever you want. It's incredible. I mean, what did you actually see? So when you, so you, you talked about your mom and dad's situation, dad was working a ton or what was it? What did you feel like the situation was? I mean, not to unpack that, but yeah. what did you see from that that you were like, I don't want to apply that to my life? 
Yeah, dad, I mean, dad was definitely working a ton. He was working from home at the time, though. So he was always kind of there, but available. But he was wrapped up in his work quite a bit. Mom had some other issues where, yeah, th- there was a there was just a disconnect that probably started very early on sure, for them. Sure, yeah. That started to manifest itself later on. Particularly, I think that that driving factor in me was more to go, hey, how do you start this thing off right? If it's marriage is a goal and I want to have a good family, how do you build that foundation from step one without having to go back and fix things that you broke or start on a faulty foundation? Like, how do you just set that stuff up properly from day one? So that that was probably more the incentive that was created by that. And knowing like they both had their issues and their responsibilities in it and they, yeah, it went the way it did. So yeah, you love them both. And that's, mm-hmm. it's not to unpack that and to say anything negative about anybody. The main thing I was thinking is, as I wanted to actually kind of relate it to, like you mentioned with the doctors that I was working with. So yeah. I, in my third and fourth year of college, I was working with a pediatric surgery practice. I was doing research with them and shadowing them a ton. And just, it was kind of like, it was a little bit of everything dude tagging along on your elbow, kind of like everywhere you went. So the surgeons would always mention to me, I had a couple that were really influential in my life and um, still in touch with them today. And they would tell me a lot, like, why do you do something where you can just like, you can have a life like anesthesia or like, you know, they would always try to talk me out of the surgery route. And it was, it was interesting because spending time with the surgeons and in their offices, like I would go to the office sometimes and I would ask the office manager, you know, so-and-so they hear, and he's like, you know, and I would find out from people in the office that, oh, he makes it home. He's probably home maybe four or five days out of the month. And he's pretty much sleeping the whole day he's home. And that's the reason like, you know, their marriage is on the rocks. And what I, anyways, what, what ended up happening for me too is, so I told you about it because you are such a specialist with the head and the vestibular system and functional neurology that I was relaying to you that story of the traumatic brain injury, right? Well, that TBI was the best thing that ever happened to me because it set me back and made me think during my recovery on my bike ride across the country, I was thinking about what I wanted for my life. Instead of like, what did I want people to see me as in my life? Yeah, I thought about what I wanted from life. What did I want to contribute to life? Not what did I want other people to see me as? That was, it was my identity. Yeah. I had very 100%. strong identity with that. Yeah. I mean, that would probably be similar to myself and, and my whole dropping out experience becoming, because I have on my mom's side, I think three out of three of her brothers, or at least two of her brothers are doctors. Okay. And then like, so everyone in my family just like had a degree. My, both my brothers are engineers. Like, so me dropping out of college, especially as the youngest one was like, no, no, like not cool. Got a lot of flack from a lot of different family members on that front. And like you said, it's, hey, am I worried about your perception of me? Do I need to fulfill this just to like fit in? Or what do I actually want? What do I want to accomplish? Yeah, when I look at now, probably, what is that, 10, 11 years later, look at my marriage, look at my life, all these things. They're like, yeah, I got to build that. And I'm and I'm not disappointed about that at all. You can be yes. proud of that, man. I mean, what yeah. you've done, it's so cool. Why, why don't you kind of take us into, I mean, what you're doing now? Because What you do, there are so few people who really, one, have probably heard of what you do. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I think it's so impactful that we're having this conversation too and introducing you to people is that what you're able to do with your knowledge is far superior to many other ways of going about trying to get the same outcome. And there's super intervention, you know, people who have like really high intervention ways to do things drugs, surgery, all these different things. When you come at things with such an amazing approach and I want to kind of unpack what you do and look the way you look at people in an, in an issue and hear some of the stories. I mean, you've got incredible stories about people you've helped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's always important to start with, for a basic for everyone, it's just, it's essentially functional neurology. I mean, you're using, you're understanding the brain and the system and how everything works in that entire loop to be able to, to help people out. And that's kind of the perspective. So I think the the main thing to understand for people when it comes to the way that I approach things or the way that I look at things with everyone is your brain basically does three things. And its primary job before those three things is to keep you alive. Your brain doesn't care what you're doing tonight for dinner. It cares that you're going to survive right now and not fall out of that chair and stay bound, right? Like your brain doesn't care about the gold medal attempt that you're successful at it. It cares that you survive it, right? So that being the main priority for your brain, 
It basically does three things to keep you safe and alive. First is take an input. It's got to take an input from the surrounding environment. So that's your eyes, your ears, you knowing what's going on around you, right? So like 70 to 90% of your sensory information coming in through your eyes. The eyes are absolutely a big deal. It's got to take an internal information. What's my heart rate? What's my blood pressure? Because I can't make changes if I don't know where that stuff's at. Like what's my temperature, right? If I overheat or if I get hypothermia or something, that's not a good survival plan. Like I'm going to die. Not good. So all that information coming in, then it's got to interpret it and make a decision about it. So if I can't interpret that information, or I don't know what it means, and I can't actually integrate it with all the other information coming in, then we can have problems there. And then I get an output. So most people, I always say, just based on my education, are focused on output. So what are your hormone levels? What are your movement dysfunctions? What, where are you tight? Do you have pain? Those are all outputs. And they're valuable. We need to pay attention to them. But your brain's great at giving you a protective output, but not necessarily having that be related to whatever is wrong, right? I always say with pain, but you can be sympathetic nervous system issues. It can be immune issues. All those are protective outputs, right? My immune system is there to protect me. I get bad stuff coming in and basically my, my immune system's got to go kill it, right? So it's just protecting me. So all of those outputs are protective outputs. And my brain might just give me a protective output because it doesn't feel safe based on the incoming information, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best output. Or it doesn't necessarily mean it's a good long-term plan. Might be a great short-term plan to give me ankle pain after I sprain my ankle. But if I keep getting ankle pain six months later, when we already know the tissues healed, like it's a brain problem. There's probably nothing wrong with the ankle itself because we know the tissues repaired. So yeah, when it comes to my perspective on things like that, that's kind of what I'm looking at is going input, interpretation, decision, and then output. And then going, hey, anywhere in that loop, I can put stimulus in there or I can help your brain create a more accurate picture of what's going on so that it feels safer. So if I'm lacking sensory information, I'm lacking visual skills, right? Like after the TBI that you've talked about, a lot of people have visual dysfunction. Some visual dysfunction might create like neurobehavioral disorders, right? Or emotional responses. And then just knowing like, hey, like some of those emotional responses don't mean you're a bad person. Like that just means that's an output from your brain because your brain's freaking scared right now. And we need to go back and retrain and rehabilitate some of those areas so that they can function properly again. So your brain doesn't feel threatened. For me, it's nice to almost make it like less emotional, a little more sciencey for people because it just goes, hey man, you probably just have an injury. Most neural rehabilitation is just you either have an injury where an area is underactive or it just hasn't gotten used in a while because everything is use it or lose it, right? And so it's really nice to be able to tell people like, hey, this thing's just underactive because either you haven't used it in a while, your environment didn't create a space for you to be able to practice this skill. So this thing's a bit underactive or you actually had a legit injury, which most people have some sort of TBI. The more I, I went on in practice, you would take a medical history and go back and be like, yeah, you hit your head like four times when you were 12 and then you had started having issues after that. Like, cool, that, that makes sense. But once those things are underactive, then the beautiful thing is that your brain's plastic. So you're always changing, you're always learning, you're always adapting to whatever environment or activities you're doing. So we can just do some behavior change work, have you do some training and actually rehabilitate those areas. And then you can start to regain whatever function it is that you want and actually have the freedom to do what it is you want with your life. Well, that's what's so cool about, I mean, everything you said there, it's exciting to hear because like in medicine, we focus on outputs almost I would say, I mean, you're talking about like 90% of the time, we're really focused on outputs, right? And what are you feeling and what's going on here and what are your hormone levels and what's your, what's this and how's that changing and what symptoms are you having today? You know, there's the symptom questionnaires, right? Very little time is spent on inputs. And just to have the explanation like that of you developed in this way where there's inputs that come in, there's a processing center, and then there's the outputs essentially, uh, or the integration center. And so that whole, just the way that you would describe that, and you, you have such incredible stories to share about patients who are pretty much just like people didn't really know what to do and they never knew what to do. And they probably seen all these practitioners and you're like, oh, well, that's pretty easy. Let's just change some inputs. And all of a sudden, everything works different. Will you share a couple, yeah. a couple of those stories? Yeah. I particularly thought of a couple, a couple interesting ones, and they're they're fun because they just kind of come to your mind, and you kind of forget how intense situations are for people. Because for me, I, again, this this perspective always just creates a like, oh, that's not that big of a deal. But for people that have been living with issues for 15, 20 years, like they, I mean, they're kind of at the end of their rope, right? Yeah, you're you're not calloused about it or whatever else. You're coming across as you're a very sensitive individual. It's just like, you kind of laugh because it's kind of like, oh, awesome. Like, let's get started. Like, I can help you with it. Exactly. Yeah, it's just that. Part of the reason that we've talked about me speaking up lately is because there's a bit of frustration of like, dude, it's been 20 years and like, no one's helped you with this. Like, come on. Like, seriously? Uh, so, <laughs> no, it's just one of those, like, I'm thinking of particularly this guy. 
there's a, I won't name his name, but um, he was a, he was ex-Marine. And we didn't get too much into some of his history in the military, but I knew he had some TBI. I knew he had been in the Marines for uh, 10 plus years. And he was an older gentleman, probably about 50. And he had a ton of back pain. Like when I saw him, he was, his, his torso was at like a 45 degree angle and he was hobbling in with his right, right foot really like lagging behind. And I had some other gait assessment stuff. So we kind of knew what was going on once the, the first second I saw him. But he had a spinal fusion and like L3 through 5, I think. And then somewhere up in his cervical spine, probably like C6 through 8 or something, which again, where a bunch of nerve bundles live. But he could tell he was struggling. And over the past three or four years, he had kind of declined because before that he was doing marathons and a bunch of other endurance stuff with his wife. And he had gone on a really, really sharp decline. Long story short, just just kind of taking that in and going like, okay, he's having severe pain, probably eight or nine out of 10 pain every day, literally can't walk, can't do all this stuff. And we basically took him in about two months, like eight weeks. Like for day one, I'll say this, day one, I always want to be able to break up that pain cycle for someone. So we did a couple of drills, a visual drill, and particularly like a, a proprioceptive like movement drill for his ankle. And we were able to get rid of his pain. And he like looked at me in shock and was like, that's weird. Wait, like he came in eight to nine out of 10 in pain and you were able to get him out of pain in that first visit? Yep. And the way pain works, like that's not necessarily going to stick, but I need to show his brain like, hey, it's possible to not feel that. Yes. To get because rid of that Because that was neurotag. a loop he was in too, right? That pain yeah. loop? Yeah. It's like an, it's a neuro tag is the way they describe it where a bunch, like there's not actual pain center in the brain. The way it is, is it's just like everyone has a unique little tag, like a snowflake. And basically it's just a lighting up of all these different brain areas at certain activations and a certain time. So we call it a neuro tag. And so basically, I'm like, okay, I have to break up that neuro tag for him. I have to get that pattern to shift. And so, yeah, you give him some different stimulus. Like I said, change the input and I change the output, right? So give him some better information, make his eyes move better. I knew he had some TBI stuff going on. So we did some uh, visual rehab, oculomotor stuff, which is just eye movement drills. And then, yeah, did some ankle movement stuff. And like, he was like, oh my gosh. And he could walk, like he could walk normal. He's like walking upright when he left. So again, for someone, that's that's a huge deal, right? And that's a huge deal. Everyone loves their neurotransmitter, like dopamine type talk these days. Like that's a big dopamine hit. So that guy knows like, hey, this is possible. And you kind of you kind of instill this hope in someone that you really can't take away now because you kind of open their, they're no longer looking through the keyhole. You kind of open the door for them and they're like, oh my gosh, this is, this is amazing. <laughs> so, so like you can't really stop. So a cool part was like, like he could barely walk when he met me and then must have been, it was February. And then in April, he had to go to Spain with his daughter and his wife and all this stuff. And he was walking like 10 miles a day with no pain. Wow. And he just, we would text me from like, from Spain and just be like, Hey, we did this today. Like, look at my, look at my route, like 10 miles or like 11 miles. Or like People eight would miles. say, that's crazy, Tony. How'd you do that? You know yeah. what I mean? And yeah. it's like, I think that's why you have such a fresh attitude with all this stuff, because I think people, it does take away kind of your desire to practice medicine. If you always see people struggling and in pain and you don't have the right tools, right? It's when you want to help people and you have a good heart, that is a super frustrating feeling. Yeah. Like you're, you're stuck on outputs, right? I mean, what I do, I focus a lot on outputs. I talk a lot about inputs and I try to work with people in inputs, but there's people's mindset. They come to you, they're really output mindset oriented, right? So they're like, no, my hormones are off. Like I need to, you know, they've been off for a long time. I've been doing this. I need to, but back to, back to being able to just, your attitude about it is so fresh and so alive and so like inspiring that it's like, if people were exposed to some of this inspiration, I feel like, and, uh, and what you can help them with, I mean, this is phenomenal. So yeah. And that my, one of my main mentors, Dr. Cobb, uh, at Z health, who basically did a bunch of my education in this, he, the, one of the first things he shared about neurology is it's the science of hope. And I stick with that. Like the more I've gone through this, I'm like, oh yeah, that's the truth. Cause you're just, you literally are, when you share people like actual accurate information with people, they go like, it is super hopeful because they realize all the possibilities that are available and they don't have to be constricted to whatever diagnosis they may or may not have gotten or whatever. Very, very limited thinking. That's very linear. Um, because the system that is the human body is super complex and it's everything gets hurt together, everything gets injured together, everything heals together. It's not like this one thing's off and then everything else is just cool. Like everything else is good to go. Like, no, that's not how it works, man. Like we visited about before. I mean, disease doesn't happen in silos, right? It doesn't happen all separately. Like the only disease is the, dis I would say as a naturopathic doctor, the disturbance in the vital force. Now that may maybe sound a little bit interesting to people, but there's only one dysfunction. It will manifest in certain, in many, maybe ways for per someone. Like maybe they've got diabetes and they've got high blood pressure and they're overweight. When, you know, all these different things that they're not all separate. They're all working together. 
in their own way. And they're all an expression of just that disturbance. Yeah. And that's actually one of the notes that I had written down for this. And just you asked me about a couple of topics and I was like, well, it was for me, it was always treat the individual and not the diagnosis per se, right? Because if you have XYZ diagnosis, you're going to have some sort of protocol to treat that. But if you don't look at the person and their history and know that everyone is a unique individual with unique compensations from whatever the environments and the history they have, then you're going to miss the target. You can't help it. Like you might get some stuff right. And it's like, you'll see people get better somewhat from some tr- like treatments and different modalities, but you don't actually look at the individual and help them become better with their dysfunction. You're going to, you're going to miss it. You're just going to be stuck in this like diagnosis and treatment box. And it's just, it's super linear and you miss a lot, right? Frustrating. As we yeah. said, super frustrating. Mm-hmm. One of the things I wanted to bring up real quick, cause you just kind of blew my mind with it was when we were visiting last and I was telling you about my CrossFit, my overhead squats and stuff like that. You know, I was like, Hey, these are super tough. Cause I can't get my arms far enough back. And, you know, and then I always feel like I'm, things are off. You were like, well, it's really hard for me to hear that you have a problem like that and not to just tell you how to fix it, you know, or, or like give you one solution, one, one input. Right. And so you had me doing what you called pencil pushups. It was a stark difference between my pre-flexion and post-pencil push-up flexion. It was unbelievable, the change in that. That, to me, really instantly just hammered home what I had remembered from school and what you're saying, which is like, you change one small input, you get a massive change in output. And, And you know what? I didn't stretch. I didn't do anything different. You know, all these output things that people think about. We were sitting down for two hours, basically. Right. And then you just stood up and just tested, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was just mind-blowing. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the fun part about it is there's an element of work to all this, right? Plasticity doesn't happen overnight. Like there's there's some there's some load that needs to happen in order to make changes. But also it's really cool how quick the system can change too. Like I think that's the the fun part about it is going like it doesn't have to be this like six month treatment cycle and we're like we're really grinding away at it. It's just like no, like if you're missing this one little thing and I just put it back into place, like that's it. It's the old analogy of the what is it, the carpenter that comes over to fix the guy's creaking wood floors, right? And it's just like, okay, he just walks over the wood floor a little bit. He's starting to feel where the creek is. And then he puts one nail in it, fixes the problem, charges the guy 500 bucks. And the guy's like, why are you, why am I, why are you charging me 500 bucks? And he's like, well, you paid me for the 20 years of experience of knowing where to put the nail, not necessarily the amount of work that I did, right? Right. It's all that. It's that whole concept of like that story of like, hey, like we don't have to, I don't have to put 20 nails in you. I'm like, ah, oh, it's just this one thing, right? You told me like, you're like, hey, I had a trochlear lesion when I had my TBI. I'm like, okay, so let's work on your trochlear nerve. Like you literally just told me what, what to do and that's it. And it's it's simple, especially with with the well, pathways. I wish I would have had you around. You know, it's interesting. I, obviously, I feel like everything happens for a reason, the learning and all that and uh, everything in life. Imagine having had you around post TBI when I was seeing PT and I was doing, I didn't do any OT. I did a lot of speech and language pathology. There was a lot of memory tactics. There was a lot of different things going on there, but I really appreciate your knowledge and, you know, your knowledge of the brain, you know, it took me back to neurophysiology and and neuroanatomy and all that, but I don't even need to know any of that because I just visit with you and I'm like, just tell me what's going on, Tony. And it was interesting how you talked about the development of the brain and what was so would be so probably enlightening for a lot of people too, is just the development of the brain and why these inputs and what are the various inputs that you're usually working on and why are they so effective in having such drastic outputs? If you look at something, we call it the neural hierarchy. I'd have to look at what they actually call it in literature. But if you're looking at the way, basically the way your brain creates safety for you, you're thinking like my visual system, my vestibular system, and then my proprioceptive system. We kind of have this this hierarchy. Break those down. What do those mean for people? Yeah. So your visual system is obviously your eyes, um, their ability to move. Again, if I'm walking down the street and I'm just going for a walk and then I see two figures that are coming up upon me, one of them is a short one, one of them is a tall one. And you're kind of like analyzing all this information, right? And okay, there's a leash and that looks like, that looks like a dog. And like, okay, that's a person. You're using your visual system to actually like extrapolate like, hey, based on previous patterns, based on pattern recognition, I've seen this before. Is it a friendly dog? Is it a mean dog? Does it look like a big dog? Is it a German shepherd? Is it a little pit bull? Is it a little poodle? Like whatever. Hopefully it's not a tiger, right? And based on that, you're going like, oh, should I go to the other side of the street? Should I stay on this side? Should I should I just like increase my distance around these people? And all those things. So like you're constantly doing this pattern recognition prediction cycle in your brain. And the eyes are the the quickest way to do that. I don't want to feel the tiger bite me on my skin and go, hey, that input's scary. Like I shouldn't, like I want to see the tiger and go like, hey, let's get in the car and like drive away. 
So that's what your eyes do for you, right? From a prediction standpoint, it makes sense. Like they're, they're probably the most effective at that, right? And from a movement standpoint, like anytime you do movement, you're pretty much using your eyes to track, right? If you, any of you have gotten up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and you're moving all slow and <laughs> gingerly trying not to hit stuff and try not to fall, like, yeah, you realize how important your eyes are for movement. That's crucial. And then you add in what's called your vestibular system, which essentially it's that equilibrium in your inner ear that you hear people talk about. Essentially, it's got a couple jobs, but it's going to tell you which way you're moving. It's going to tell you which way up is. So which way gravity is, right? And it's going to just tell me a little bit about like head motion and things like that in space. My head's moving and people get dizzy from head movement. Like I go, hey, you might have some vestibular things that are going on and maybe I can't process that information. So I'm getting output of dizziness or something of that nature. So if those two systems aren't matching up, you'll see stuff like motion sickness. That's a really easy example where you're sitting in the car, you're reading whatever it is on your phone or book or whatever. And so my visual system's telling me, hey, everything's still because the page that I'm reading is still and I'm just sitting here reading my book. But your vestibular system's telling you like, hey, we're going down the road at 75 miles an hour and I'm getting what they would call sensory mismatch or sensory disintegration where like, hey, those two things aren't matching up. My brain can't make sense of those two inputs. And all of a sudden I get motion sickness. I feel like I want to throw up. Part of where that vestibular system processes information in the cortex is really close to where uh, your brain maps out your gut. So you start to feel like, hey, like I might, might want to throw up right now, right? Pull over, guys. Yeah, exactly. So you get that on the boat too. What's the cure on the boat, right? Hey, go out, look at the horizon. I got a stable view. I got a nice picture of where vertical is for my visual system and it starts to match up with my vestibular system. What do you do in a car? What would you recommend? I mean, just first thoughts, like someone's getting this, uh, I get that motion sickness, right? You're cruising up and you've got mountain highway roads and you're just kind of this windy, curvy road and you're kind of feeling like, oh boy. And then you also want to, ideally you turn the AC on because the warmer you get, the worse it gets, right? Yeah. So you get the warmth, you get the dizziness going on and you're, you know, like Dramamine drive, you know I mean? It's just like, oh boy, they call it like you're just, you're getting car sick and you know you're going to have to pull over and jump out. It depends on the person. Sometimes there's a point of no return for some people, but we'll have people focus on something in the distance where they can keep it on. If it's on a curvy road, I'll just try to have you like fixate on some targets maybe where you can like, okay, I can look at that marker and it's going to go by me and look at the next marker. It's going to go by me. Uh, Hopefully something that's a little further off. So you don't have to keep switching targets so Mm -hmm. fast, but like, yeah, getting your visual system to focus is pretty helpful. That's worked for me in the past. So that's curious that you say that, like I would usually find something that's going to be stable and steady and just focus on that. And sometimes it's outside of the car, ideally, right? Inside the car, does that really work? Uh, you could try it. It can work for some people. And some people, like I said, there's kind of that point in no return where they just need a break for their vestibular system, go outside, focus on a target, just fixate on it for like 10 to 30 seconds and you should be okay. That's kind of the horizon thing on the boat too, right? Go out, look at the horizon, fixate on it. Let your system match up those two inputs again and kind of just relax hopefully. <laughs> so you talked about eyes and then now we talked about vestibular system a little bit. So this is our balance, you know, helps us with balance too, right? Right. Balance, spinal stability. And again, all that all that stuff is to keep us upright and keep us from falling, essentially, right? There's a big, I don't know, you guys can go look up statistics on how many people die from falling every year, but it's a lot more than you'd think. It's more dangerous than a lot of other things. So yeah, it's pretty high up there. And so yeah, your brain takes it as a serious threat of like, hey, falling's pretty dangerous, so I should probably stay balanced. So again, if I don't have an accurate vestibular information coming in, what's a good way to get me to sit down? Back pain, knee pain, maybe get dizzy, something like that, right? Because then I'm not, not no longer in danger of falling. <laughs> That's right. right. That makes sense? Yep. So it's it's interesting because people are like, oh, back pain. I, I'm getting off on a tangent. But yeah, hey, back pains because you have an XYZ thing going on in your back. I'd be like, maybe, maybe that input is is not helping. Maybe it's threatening for your brain, but it could be a lot of other stuff too. And then I think the third one you we talked about kind of those those sensory bits of sensory information that this is all as it pertains to movement for the most part, but it would be proprioception. So it's like where my body is in space, kind of know where my wrist is in space. I know where my neck is in space and I can actually have the ability to move those. Um, there's a great amount of um, the majority of your brain space is actually like made for movement. Motor outputs are the way we interact with the world. Everything I'm thinking right now, everything I'm saying, these are all motor outputs. It's the only way that I can interact with the world. So a great deal of my brain is devoted to that. And so there's a bunch of brain mapping areas for like, hey, where, where are my body parts in space? And the motor maps for like how they move, how accurate they are, how much I can feel them as they move. There's a great bit of that. And if that's, if that's messed up too, and I go, okay, well, well, my neck, because like neck proprioception, like my neck, where it is in space and my vestibular system and my eyes is all really important, right? Because if I'm tilting my head, it's telling my vestibular system one thing, but if my neck proprioception is poor and I'm getting these different inputs from these vertebrae and they're not quite matching up, I could just tilt my head to the side and get really dizzy because my brain goes, oh shoot, that's weird. 
that stuff's not matching up. Super basic example, but you'll see it all the time. And you'll see it particularly in a lot of like gym culture stuff where everything's like, hey, head has to be up, neutral spine, blah, 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 blah. That's all fantastic in terms of safety and being safe with weights and doing some strength training stuff. But if I never go outside of that, the second I start to turn my head quickly to catch a visual target, I do something athletic or do something like that, you can start to see a lot of issues with people. Because again, what do we talk about? Injury or disuse, right? Yes. Disuse is huge, disuse especially is huge. among like first world populations like America. You just go, hey, you're not doing anything athletic. You're not having to turn your eyes to catch you a visual target to be able to detect threats. Like everything's straight on for you. It's straight in front of the computer. It's straight up when you lift weights. And so all of a sudden we have a bunch of vestibular or visual dysfunction because I don't have to look at anything when I'm lifting weights and I don't have to move my head at all. And all of a sudden we're like, oh, why do we see all these like autoimmune disorders and like this bodybuilding fitness community? Why do we see all this other stuff go on? And it's not a critique of them as people. It, it's just, hey, that that will happen if we start to disuse some certain brain areas and like we start to have some some mismatch problems. So. What do you think are some good things? So people who are living in this more of a vertical world, maybe they're sitting at their desk. Think about the general population, right? Either people are working from a home office now or they're working at an office and um, they're sitting on computers a lot, maybe not even stand up desking, maybe they're sitting a lot. So then they go and then they leave there and then they, they go to lunch, they sit again and then they go back home at the end of the day, maybe then they go or straight to the gym and then they're doing, they're, they're living in a very up and down, very vertical world, right? I mean, just give us examples of like, what would be some things that would get them outside of that? Like you talked about that would allow them to kind of experience yeah. Yeah, there's different a, inputs. There's quite a bit of different things because there's a ton of different things you could do. But from a basic standpoint, some of the main things I, I start people with, if they're office athletes, as I call it, is first of all, like make sure you're taking breaks from your computer screen and getting up and diverging your eyes. Divergence is basically your eyes moving in opposite directions. So if I have to look at something close, both my eyes are going to turn in to be able to look at my computer screen, right? And then full divergence, which is my eyes looking apart, is to look at something far. The full divergence is like 40 meters or more. So typically I'm trying to get people to go, hey, we're on screens 10 or 12 hours a day for stuff that's closer than 40 meters. So my eyes are converged. Let's start by just going, hey, look at something far off in the distance. It's part of the reason why like you love hunting, you love getting outdoors, right? Mm -hmm. It's part of the reason it's so therapeutic for people because every even in the city environment, everything's so just thinking about that. I feel like the best crazy sensory input changes happened when I was out in the field for eight days with my bow. It was freezing cold. I was hiking and then it would warm up during the day. It was like I had all these different sensory input. I'm listening to animals. I'm watching things move and I'm hiking up hills as I'm trying to track something that's staying stable in the distance. It was so different than anything in, in normal, quote unquote, normal life. It's, it's like the exact opposite. And you're getting to experience all these different like inputs and skills that you're working on that are like so different than the normal environment you're used to. Felt like I was a kid going to bed at night. I fell asleep so I could fall asleep so easily because I was so... Like my mind was so busy in such a primitive way all day long. Yeah. But I fell asleep like a baby every single night. Yep. And it's funny, you're like sleeping on a cot or some terrible thing in the field and yeah. you're like, I sleep better than I sleep at home almost. That's right. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly it. Where, you're, where your brain's literally like, oh, like, again, it, to, to be healthy, the brain needs fuel and it needs activation. And all that activation, all that extra activation is super healthy. Like it's great. I'm almost taking like that experience and I'm like breaking it down to like minimal components of like, so for you practically at home, like what do you, what do you do if it, it's every hour on the hour that you want to take a break? What are some basic stuff you can do? And that's where you're saying like, okay, like, can I go outside and go for a walk and like actually just listen to stuff all around you, right? Having that auditory mapping and, and being able to go like, there's a bird there, there's a bird there. Am I right? Oh, that was a little off on that one. Okay. Like being able to actually go out and, and do what we call tonotonic mapping with your auditory system. Like I said, diverging your eyes, getting your eyes to move. So like I'll do similar drills that I did with yourself where like I'll take a pen and look at the pen tip and we'll do like just a circle with it around your, your face like three or four times and just track that pen tip again. Just getting my eyes out of that kind of very isometric, like static place. If I had you hold a bicep curl for eight hours a day, you wouldn't suddenly look at me after a week and be like, man, this is weird why my like elbow won't straighten out well or like fully flex well. Like you, you wouldn't be surprised by that. And then all of a sudden, like we're sitting with like static eyes on the screen basically for, like I said, 10, 12 hours a day, I think is pretty much average these days. And, and you go, okay, like, yeah, that, that's going to create some dysfunction, particularly over long stretches of time, like years. Yeah. And that's where you, you start to see a lot of different outputs happen where that are just protective outputs of your brain. So it's really interesting. Wow. You're a very fit guy. You take mm -hmm. care of yourself. 
Mm-hmm. What are the things that you like to do for fitness? For fitness, I still enjoy the heck out of weight training. So I, I definitely do that. I do jujitsu usually three to four days a week at least. Um, so martial arts has been really, really good, especially with some of the pain rehab that I've been through. I used to play pretty competitive soccer, so a lot of semi-pro soccer. So I still play soccer once or twice a week. I get out there and try to run at least eight to 10 miles, which is really great. Yeah, I'll go I'll go shooting, shooting and hunting with the boys. Just all that stuff, you know? So fun, man. Will you Tell me about the jujitsu piece of it. It's kind of caught on and it's kind of become more of a vogue thing to be talked about. I mean, obviously there's some big influencers that are practicing it, who are talking about it. You have people like Joe Rogan and some of them who talk about jujitsu, I think, or bring on people like, what? what is it about jujitsu that is captivating people and also transforming fitness for people? This is more philosophical in it's nature okay. and a little bit of science So now that you guys know kind of some of my science philosophy stuff, it's helpful on a couple levels. I think one, two, if we talk about the brain being primary job being survival first over everything, being able to protect yourself, super useful skill to reduce threat for your nervous system. You're like, hey, I feel more confident. I feel more comfortable as a man just being able to like, no, I can handle myself if anything were to happen in an altercation. Not that jujitsu is a silver bullet. I do I do work a lot in combatives and, and other violent activities and jujitsu is not a silver bullet, but just having that experience and experiencing that every day, there's an element of pattern recognition there that for someone who isn't trained versus someone who is trained, that person who is trained is a heck of a lot more comfortable being in tight spaces, having a lot of pressure on them, being uncomfortable, like it's normal to them. So from a survival standpoint, I think there's an element of that that's that's very, very useful and healthy for people. From a brain standpoint, there's a lot of different things I know that help me. But uh, again, it would just be more in terms of like, uh, I think about predictive autonomics and things like, I used the example with you about the insular cortex last time we talked, where I go, hey, if, if I'm riding a bike and I'm, I'm riding normally on a flat surface and then I see a hill, my brain has to go, hey, you know what? Like that hill is going to be harder than what we're normally doing. We might have to increase heart rate, blood pressure, all this other stuff. So in terms of like what we call sympathetics, which are all those kind of autonomic functions we need for, for to maintain homeostasis, your brain has to do that predictively. Well, when I go in and I essentially fight people, it's not an actual fight, but when I go wrestle with people and get put in really uncomfortable situations, like that all of a sudden becomes more predictable to me. And I, now I actually understand what like, oh, that's actually threatening. Like that guy's going to break my shoulder. That guy's going to choke me and make me pass out. Like that's actually threatening. Your little work tiff or your little email you got from a client is not that threatening anymore. It's not that big a deal. So your right. brain actually has this context for like what I say, what I call predictive autonomics, but what I just say for pressure generally to go like, hey, oh, so that's a big deal. Like this thing's not a big deal anymore. It gives okay, you some cool. perspective. You know, yeah. when you're talking about like that specifically, we, we talk about people being stressed all day long in their different environments. That's a pretty big deal. I mean, people get, oh, they get an email that sets off, you know, their sympathetic nervous system and then their, you know, cortisol, cortisol spikes. And I've had patients come to me who have high cortisol pretty much around the clock and then they develop cortisol resistance and then cortisol doesn't really do what it needs to do anymore. And then in, they either need to go on a really depressive period of time where they're just pretty much withdrawing from all the stimuli, which that's pretty depressing if you're used to getting stimulated with cortisol all the time. Or else prescribe more cortisol, which it works short term and it doesn't, it's not a good long term outcome because then they gain weight, then everything else starts to get thrown off, hormones interact with other hormones. So you can see how I would say changing inputs, what you're talking about is really the ultimate in terms of helping people. Outputs aren't the ultimate, input they're, is the they're ultimate. They're a byproduct. They're a byproduct. Yeah. They yeah. absolutely are a byproduct. And that's what's so so attractive about what you do is that you're, you are, in, you are absolutely talking, talk about inputs, like talking about them, changing them for people. You and I, when we sat down, I'm thinking to myself, oh, there's X number of inputs. You're like, there's like thousands of inputs. Like if something mm-hmm. doesn't work, you kind of laugh and go, great, let's move on to the next one. Let's try the next one. And then you'll find one that works. Yeah. Well, if you think about the entire system from like, I have receptors in my skin and my muscle spindles and all this other stuff to peripheral nerves that travel along that. And those peripheral nerves have nerves that innervate them and they have capillaries that, inter- that send blood to them. And then they, that goes to the spinal cord. And then that goes to this brain area, to this brain area. Like you can pick any part along that chain and just go, hey, 
Let's change some input there because maybe that's where I'm having a problem. Maybe I'm having a problem in a receptor level. Maybe my receptors in my foot just aren't working right. I did that with the guy that had uh, back pain that will, went and walked Spain 10 miles a day. One day we like couldn't get his pain to change because he was just having a rough one. And I literally went back and fixed the sensation in his feet. He couldn't feel like sharp and dull properly. And there's certain receptors for that in certain parts of the spinal cord that that information travels on. And it was just like, okay, cool. That's that's the one. Dorsal thalamic track. Uh, yeah, spinal thalamic track. Spinal yeah. thalamic. Yeah. Oh, you got, oh man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. You're close because oh, it's dorsal column. God. Dorsal column dorsal. is on the posterior side. Yeah. And that does all your like fine touch, uh, light vibration stuff. Okay. And then the spinothalamic track is like uh, the anterior one. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all like pain. And that's like anterior. the primitive stuff, right? Like that's. Yeah. So the lateral spinothalamic is what is it? No susception and temperature. You guys, I'm all getting flashbacks yes. right now from yeah. neurophys so, in school. I literally, that was so, such a hard this, course. And here he's just a master. I've got the master in my office here. That's funny. Oh, um, yeah. Geez. And for those of you out there, just so I can say this legitimately, there are no pain receptors. It's called no susception and no C mean like no C, no carom when you took your oath, right? means I will do no harm. It's just harm receptors. They're just saying, hey, like that's what it, when I was stabbing them with a the needle, they're no receptors because it's just, hey, that could be harmful. <laughs> Watch out. But it doesn't mean that they're sending pain signals because pain is an afferent. Pain is an output. It doesn't come in as an input, right? That probably blew a lot of your minds if you're paying attention right now and you were that piece, there is no pain uh, inputs. There's only pain as an output. It's yep. super interesting. Yeah. Which is good for you to know. Generally. It's very good. I mean, if you've got pain, what what input do I need to change to change that output? That's what should people be, should be thinking about. Exactly. Yep. And I think pain, and then I, I always like to have people, because I care, again, based on my background, it's actually good that we touched on the whole like divorce, like family thing earlier. Because part of this for me, I always think of family interactions and mm-hmm. go like, hey, like your lack of patience or your frustration or your emotional output, your emotions are a motor output. Motion is in the word emotion. So it's a motor output going like, hey, why am I getting that motor output? Like, did I eat enough? Have I just spent 10 hours in front of a computer and I'm a little frustrated or is something at work or whatever? And going like, hey, maybe I need to change that output so that I have better interactions with my kids or my spouse or whatever it might be. So I always think that's interesting because my wife and I have really good communication about this. We're like, hey, I'm low on fuel right now. Or hey, like this XYZ thing, I'm feeling like this right now. So that we know, hey, output's not great right now. Let's adjust the outputs. And then if we have to have a serious conversation about something or if we need to connect, then we do that after. But then we can always address, go, oh, okay, you're not, you're not, your outputs aren't optimal right now. Like, hey, let's fix that together. Let's do that together. This is a super practical thing that anybody could do with the people around them. Oftentimes, you know, I know there's been times for me where like, I know I need to eat something and I know I've been frazzled because maybe I had a second cup of coffee, like a big cup of coffee or something like that. And I'm like, I know my sympathetics are in overdrive. I'm low on fuel and something stressful kind of happened. And I'm like, and I forget to tell my wife like that exact thing. Like, I just need to eat something first and then let's have a conversation. Instead, I say something and I was like, that was just dumb. Like, what did I even say that? You know, that was just stupid. And then I have to, you know, of course, apologizing and whatever else, but it's after the fact. It's like, I could have been more proactive about it and just had good communication about it. These are practical things everybody can do. Yeah. Again, for me, it's all about just putting the power back in people's hands and going like, you don't just have to be subject to that stuff. You can go, oh, you can actually like have a pattern interrupt in the middle of that moment and go like, oh, shoot, like I can actually do something about this and then go to actually do the thing that helps and then come back. So like I always post once a week because of some of the veteran organizations I work with and those guys, I always try to post once a week on my Instagram about like, hey, if you're feeling overwhelmed or anxious or whatever, like here's like a breathing drill or a different like drill to be able to help calm down and feel better because that's a thing for people. And there's some of the most popular ones that I that I post because that's a thing people deal with quite a bit, particularly with the day and age we live in. So I always want to relate that back to like, Pain is an easy one to see for people, but then especially in your world, like immune system outputs, autoimmune issues, those type of things, all the way back down to practically like how I'm interacting with people. I think it's important to to recognize it in all situations because I want people to perform better everywhere, not just in the gym, not just on your blood test. Like those are great things, but they're not, in my mind, they're not the most important things. What are you up to right now? I mean, what are you working on or what do you have coming out next that people can look into? I know you're on Instagram. We're going to talk about that. I think that that's 
one of the cool places for people to be, anybody to be able to find you mm-hmm. when you get help. Actually, talk about Instagram first, because that's yeah. like your main, one of your main spots right now. Yeah, that's now. one of my main spots. I don't have a ton of followers, but I've been working on that the past couple months. I was previously with the the company I talked about with Z Health, and I was working for them as an education advisor. And I've since transitioned out of that to go and, and launch this this program that I'm working on. And that's the whole reason I've got back on Instagram. So, so yeah, I've been on Instagram, just trying to share stuff with people, trying to get some awareness for some of these subjects that I'm talking about. we just launching my YouTube channel here in a couple of weeks as well, just to help, just a more of a long form format to have more practical drills to help people with for some of the things that we've talked about here. And then, yeah, like you said, launching a, launching a program mostly for 30 to 50 year olds that are looking to get out of pain and just move better, feel better, that type of thing. Ooh. Kind of, yeah. That hits a lot of people right there. Yeah. Those people, hey, you know, when you're feeling like, hey, like my body's breaking down, I can't do what I used to be able to do. Like, ah, like it's that frustrating moment and you're just like, okay, well, this is only on a downhill trajectory for those people that know that have a little bit of maturity and like to train and like to be active, but they're like, ah, this is not clicking the right way. It's not, it's not moving the way it used to. Um, those are the, those are the people I kind of designed a program for after a lot of market research and a lot of figuring out kind of who and what I wanted to work with. So phenomenal. Well, those are a lot of the guys that come to us too. Cause they're like, man, it must be my hormones. Right. Mm-hmm. So now I have a good, I have a good spot for, for the, to send those guys. Here. I'm like, eh, not your hormones. You need, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you need yeah. Tony and his work. We can, yeah. we can address the hormones and we know that they're there and then also go, we have to look at the rest of the that's system and right. go, hey, what's yeah. going on, man? No, I love, I, that's the thing is you have such a, a really neat thing. I think we're only as strong as the sum of all the parts. And I have such a small spot in the realm of things, really, um, especially if I'm just dealing with hormones and I, I, I do other input stuff too, but I have such a small spot. And it, for me to be the best doctor that I'm going to be, I need to have people in my corner like you who I can refer to and send people to bounce ideas off of. Like it only makes me better at what I do. And it only ma- like we're the, you know, the sum of its parts, right? We are the system. I've always tried to have a great referral network. And then, I, I mean, I always talk about this in terms of, you, if you look at any studies on like social interactions with people, like humans are tribal. Like that's how we survived for so many years. Like that's how we're awesome and why we kind of run the world the way we do um, because of our ability to interact and work together. So like that is it's such a key component for, for all of us to be successful and wherever it is we want to be successful. So that's I right. love it. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's great. So the Instagram thing, uh, I was going to bring it back to that too. Yeah, yeah. I love it because you have super actionable videos on there for people too. And there's like the title on there and it's like, you experiencing this, try this. And there's a lot of that on there. You've helped a lot of different organizations and people. It's really neat to see the amount of, of individuals you've helped. I mean, you've, you've helped used to get pediatric referrals. Yeah. I mean, you're not doing all this right now, but you had pediatric referrals from the children's hospital. You're helping vets. You've got a very wide range of experience. Yeah. And yeah. Over how many years have you been doing this? The neurology piece particularly started in like 2017. Amazing. So four and a half, five years. Yeah, yeah. five years-ish. Yeah, really wow. dug into that. I think I'd have to do my bio for you uh, as I wrote it up. And I realized like I had done 400 plus hours of like extra coursework on just functional neurology generally. Which is, I looked at it, I was like, that's that's a lot of time, man. <laughs> like, that's a lot of time. Well, and that's like thousands of hours with actual clients too, which has been super cool. But I just realized I'm like, oh, that that's a lot of experience, um, which is kind of funny for me at 30. It's just nice to see, honestly, on paper to have some metrics. But yeah, it is, there's a there's a ton of different things. I I remember, so you talking about the hormones, which was interesting. And you asked me for a couple of different stories. And I remember looking back and when I had first, first started, like back in 2017, I had this client that had SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. For those of you that, that don't know the acronym, it's, um, and she was struggling with it for years. Like she had done all the protocols and it was, it was probably three or four years in. And I think some of the protocols are supposed to fix it within like six months to a year, right? She's still dealing with gas and bloating and all that. Yeah. All that yeah. stuff. Like didn't, didn't want to eat carbs or anything. And so I had slowly started to like work her back into carbs in a way that was like the right minimal effective dose, like not to mess with her. But then I come back from like my first little like neurology course with Z Health and I was like, all right, well, I think some of this, like I said, vestibular and gut stuff right next to each other, right? Long story short, I had her doing vestibular stuff for like three months, just kind of hardcore, really basic. Like I didn't know what I was doing. I just very, very basic, like entry level stuff. She comes back to me six months later and is like, so uh, yeah, the SIBO has gone. Like they did a test on me for the, <laughs> for the actual bacteria and like, it's not there anymore. And I was like, that's pretty cool. Cause just, just that one thing, like we did the same training. I was personal training at the time. We we're doing basically all the other same strength training stuff. I literally just added in the vestibular stuff for her. And like that went away. That was the only factor that she changed. And a little bit of extra carbs, right? We started to up that as things going on. So mm-hmm. Because fuel is important for your brain too, kids. Yes. Um, yeah, just minor detail. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
things like that, where it's just, you start to look back on the whole experience and you go, dang, that's, that's pretty freaking crazy, honestly. Because you would go to any environment, especially in your field, and they would just be like, well, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it's just idiot. It's all the whole idiopathic. Like, I don't know what it is. I don't know what caused it. And good luck. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. all right, well, let's, let's figure that out, though. You know what I mean? So that's been, it's fun to look back on some of those things and go, that's, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. We had uh, a lot of, we actually had one teacher who really worked on vagus nerve stuff in school, which was really, really cool. Vagus yeah. stimulation, stuff like that. Just naturally, you know, with gargling and all kinds of different activities. Super cool stuff. We had some really neat out there, what we considered at the time, you know, more out there lectures and we loved it. We went to school as naturopathic doctors to be more holistic and to think, a, we, we all thought a little bit more open-minded than, you know, your standard allopathic education, which no, no throwing stones at allopathy. I love it. Helps a lot of people. We wanted to do things differently. And so this was cool because we had teachers like you come in and give us educational seminars over weekends and stuff about what you're doing and helping people. It's just, it's just awesome. How can people find you on Instagram? Yeah, go to tony.j.ryan. If you type in Tony Ryan, it'll pretty much come up. Yeah, you can find me on Instagram. I have a little calendar link there for the, the program that I mentioned too, for that 30 to 50 year old population. If you guys are dealing with pain or you're dealing with any other, just any other issues and you feel like things are breaking down, you can just do a quick little consult with me. I can see if you're right for the program. Just make sure it's a good fit for you. But yeah, and then look for the YouTube channel to be coming out here pretty quick in the next uh, two to three weeks. It might be up right now by the time this launches, yeah, right? It will so be, yeah. I'll have all the links in the show notes for everybody. You guys can just click on them if you go to the bottom of the notes there and uh, we'll have those links there for you. Yeah, man, it's just, it's, I don't know, all I can say is it was so, uh, so serendipitous to have met you at the range and just the fact that shooting with Adam Stewart, who'd been on the podcast so long ago. Got to get him back on to talk about his his boxing career now and everything. But the introduction and then everything went from there, our, our, our meeting at the coffee shop. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is absolutely needing to happen like yesterday. Yeah. So, That's we, so, cool. so here we are talking about all this and I'm just... I'm just excited to have met you, brother. Yeah, same here, man. I appreciate you so much. It's been an yeah. absolute pleasure. Love connecting and I'm, I'm just excited about the future and being able to help a lot more people. If there were just a singular piece of advice for today for, for the audience, what would you say? I would say... Well, I always take it back to the hope thing of like, there's always a solution to every problem. That kind of mentality, just understand like equifinality is a thing. That's the concept I always try to, when I would teach people, I'd always try to teach them like, if we're trying to get to 10, it doesn't have to be eight plus two. It can be five plus five or four plus six or two and a half plus seven and a half. Like I, it doesn't matter. Like there's a ton of different ways to get to the same end points. So I don't feel as constricted or rigid to, about that solution either. Like there's a lot of different ways to do it. So just have the freedom and have the hope to move forward and, and get past whatever it is you need to get past and go live your life to the fullest. You are the man. Thank you so much. What a pleasure. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to the Rise Again podcast. Great episode, hey? You know what? I really love interviewing people and I love getting people on who have things to share with the world. So if you have a really cool guest that you'd like to get on the podcast, email me and I will do my best to get them on the show. I hope you guys have a phenomenal week and stay tuned for the next episode of the Rise Again podcast.